Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Dellen. Welcome to Massey College. Uh, I'm proud to be a senior fellow here, and I'm also CEO of the Samara Center for Democracy. Before we get into our panel discussion today, I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on land where many Indigenous peoples have lived. It is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, as well as the tra traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee. We want to acknowledge our duty to stewardship toward the land and the great privilege that we have to live and work on this land. Today, we're going to hear an expert panel for the Massey Dialogues titled Far and Widening, the Rise of Polarization in Canada. This conversation is presented in partnership with the Public Policy Forum, who have done such important work in this area. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator for this timely conversation, Victoria Kuketz. Victoria is an established public policy communications and community engagement professional focused on social impact. She's the Director of Corporate Engagement at Catalyst Canada and a fellow at the Public Policy Forum, where she designed, built, and scaled the recent Far and Widening the Rise of Polarization in Canada project, which is the basis for the discussion today. She's a member of the Toronto Metropolitan University's Democratic Engagement Exchange team, where she hosts the Democracy Dialogue and, on, and is on the Advisory Committee for the Canadian Vote Summit. Victoria is also on the Advisory for the Democracy Exchange Conference, and she was a Civic Action Diversity Fellow in, 2000, in 2022 and holds an HBA and MBA from the University of Toronto. So we're in very good hands for this conversation. I'll pass it over to you, Victoria. Thank you so much, Sabrina, and thank you to all of you for coming. It really means so much to everyone involved in this project. And also, we know that this is such a critical issue affecting so many of us and, you know, around our dinner tables, at, in our workplaces, and really in all kinds of dialogues we're having. So I'd like to welcome you on behalf of myself, our incredible panelists who helped to build this project, on behalf of the Public Policy Forum and McGill Center for Media, Technology and Democracy. And I'd also like to thank you on behalf of our funders as well, the Government of Canada and the McConnell Foundation. And um, mostly I'd like to also thank Massey College for hosting us this evening and bringing us together on this very critical issue. Don't worry everybody, you take your seats, you don't have to tiptoe in, it's okay. Um, as, some as, as some of you may know, this evening's panel comes from a broad diagnostic of polarization in Canada, which included a national community of researchers. We have three of them here with us today. Uh, research institutes, advisors, civic bodies, Canadian young adults, and community organization, uh, amounting to representation from over 320 cities and included over 1,600 interdisciplinary, intersectional, and grassroots voices. Um, I also want to acknowledge the project's advisors, community members, and amplifiers. Many of you are here in the room this evening, and it really couldn't be possible without any of you. What I'll say very quickly before we get into our panel discussion is that one of the Public Policy Forum's key pillars is an ongoing and permanent commitment to a healthy democracy. This polarization study marked three years of a multi-year investment that focused on the reduction of online harms in previous years, as well as how governments and the public can motivate transparency and accountability measures to minimize the harms of online platforms, including mis- and disinformation, online hate, and abuses of privacy. I'd also like to make an important note that this work was released in late August 2023 and reflects national sentiments from earlier that year. As we enter, uh, this dialogue, I am so pleased to be able to introduce three academics who took part in this national essay series we commissioned as part of the project. So tonight, we'll talk through polarization, populism, political and social mistrust, and so much more. And to give you an idea of how we'll spend our time together, we'll have each of our speakers, including our speaker online, offer a brief lightning talk on their research, and then I'll moderate a discussion before turning to your questions. Um, so I would say get them ready. And we're really looking forward to your active participation because we know how deeply felt this is for everyone in the room. And so now uh, I'm happy to transition to our speakers. I'd first like to welcome uh, Eric Merkley to say hello to the audience. Uh, he's an assistant professor of political science at the Monk School here at U of T. Uh, pleasure, pleasure being here. Um, next slide. Um, 
I'm a, I'm a data guy, so I'm going to show you some data. That's just how I, how I, how I communicate, less in words, more in numbers. Um, but it's uh, useful to start off with just a, a, a talk about definitions. Um, we, we hear of the word polarization used quite a bit, uh, but it can mean a lot of different things uh, depending on the context. Um, it's basically any situation in which society is divided into multiple camps. Um, and that those divisions could be racial, religious, um, or most often the focus nowadays, ideological or partisan. Um, so there are lo uh, lots of layers to, the, to these possible divisions. And in the United States, the focus has been mostly on that, that partisan politics. Um, and also the integration of all of those divides that I mentioned, that, that racial, religious, class divides are intersecting with partisan divides and reinforcing all those sorts of processes. And so the question is, well, to what, to what degree is Canada on that path? And there's evidence going bo in both directions. Next slide. On the one hand, we do see growing partisan differences in ideology, um, separating the conservatives on the one side from liberals and NDP supporters on the other. We see this across a wide range of different issues. So on the screen, uh, you have environmental policy, um, opposition to nativism, same-sex marriage. On all of these, parties are becoming more divided. In some cases, they're moving in the right direction, but those divides persist anyway, all, all moving in the same direction. Um, in other cases, like on the environment, we see an even starker divide where the conservatives are moving to the right and the other parties are moving to the left. So there's ideological left-right differentiation between the parties um, more now than has ever been the case. Um, next slide. Um, and perhaps consequently, um, the parties don't like each other nearly as much as they used to. So we see something called affective polarization. Um, on, the left, uh, on the left panel, you can see people's feelings uh, on a zero to 100 feeling thermometer towards their own party, which is going up over time, towards their principal opponent, which is going down over time. Um, and that gap has more than doubled uh, since the 1980s. So we do see growing affective polarization. And on the right panel, you can see it's, it's a lot of people that really, really don't like the other side. Um, people uh, scoring zero on that zero to 100 scale. Um, a lot more of them now than used to be. Um, used to be more or less ambivalent towards our, our political opponents, but that's not, not the case anymore. And that mirrors, uh, to, to some extent, what we see in the United States. Um, so are we on the path? Yeah, on, on a couple, on a few key dimensions, uh, Canada resembles what's going on in the United States. Next slide. A lot of this comes back to our political parties. Um, they've polarized as well over time, not neatly and uniformly over time, but the polarization persists nonetheless. Um, these are comparative manifesto scores um, for the three parties. So basically, a, it's a technique that scholars use to score the parties from left to right. Um, and the top is, is on economic policy. We see movement by the liberals to the left over time. Um, and on social policy, we see the conservatives have moved to the right. Um, so all those dynamics that I talked about, left-right differentiation, affective polarization is reflected in what the parties uh, are saying and doing. Um, next slide. But where we're not polarizing is we do not see evidence of rising ideological extremism. Um, the center is still holding in Canada. Um, so we can, see, we can see this in the distributions of ideology in the Canadian election study over time. Uh, this is a, a comparison in 1997 to 2015. Um, the top is in your self-placement of ideology. The bottom is based on policy attitudes. Um, we see, if anything, movement to the left uh, in the bottom right quadrant, um, but the, the center is still holding. So there's more sorting in the electorate. The parties are more differentiated, but there isn't movement to the extremes. Um, there's a few other key differences with the U.S. We don't have the same social dynamics to our polarization. Our parties are not stratified by race and religion nearly to the same extent as the U.S. And so for a lot of those reasons, uh, Canadian polarization is, is quite a bit different from what we see south of the border. Although we perceive that polarization to be quite strong. And in fact, we perceive polarization to be about three times, two to three times stronger than is actually the case. But that's not to say that polarization isn't consequential. There's, there's a lot of potential consequences of it, especially affective polarization, that emotional polarization. Next slide. Um, we have seen that in the pandemic. 
um, and uh, some colleagues of mine and I uh, have a paper we showed at the beginning of the pandemic, there were limited partisan differences uh, in how uh, partisans responded to the pandemic. That changed over time. We saw growing, growing partisan divides on willingness to take prote protective uh, behaviors during the pandemic, uh, support for policies like lockdowns or mandates. We saw this differentiation between left and right grow over time. Uh, and we have good longitudinal evidence that suggests that people's polarization drove what they did in the pandemic. So people that were affectively polarized and conservative um, took fewer precautions. People that were on the left and affectively polarized took more precautions. Um, so polarization intersected importantly with Canada's pandemic response. Next slide. And in some recent data, uh, one of my RAs just walked in, uh, she, she was involved in, in some of this, um, <laughs> uh, has looked at uh, other consequences for affective polarization. So one is discrimination. And so we have a, a study that, that shows that um, on, on questions like, uh, who are you gonna hire to do a project? Who would you give a loan to? These sorts of things. Even when people are given very, very relevant information to the decision-making situation, they still discriminate against partisan opponents and ideological opponents. And you can see that in the, on the left side. Um, to some degree, even, even as much as getting bad information about a particular person. So say a negative credit rating um, when giving out a loan. Um, and those, that tendency towards discrimination is the strongest among the most affectively polarized. It, get, it goes, uh, grows stronger with affective polarization. Um, next slide. Even more troubling, uh, affective polarization could erode democratic norms. Uh, and so we, we gave respondents a series of scenarios about how a prime minister might behave. Uh, and we see widespread partisan hypocrisy, uh, that partisans were totally fine and across a, a range of these scenarios to support a norm violation when their side was doing it um, and not when the other side was. And that is also driven by affective polarization. So as polarization increases, partisan hypocrisy is going to go up and democratic norms might become increasingly under threat. Another thing that, that some scholars have focused in the United States is, is on partisan political violence, political violence in general. Um, next slide. Thankfully, um, endorsement of these attitudes is really, really rare in Canada, hovering between one to 5%, depending on the issue. And these match pretty closely with what we see in the US. And, and support for political violence isn't conditioned by affective polarization. It's, it's actually people with antisocial personality traits that, that agree with those sorts of positions. So norm erosion, not political violence necessarily, but still we should be, should be very concerned about affective polarization in this country. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that, Eric. Um, I'm excited to pick up a couple of those threads in our discussion, but for now, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Riley Yasno, who is a PhD student here at U of T and also a Massey Fellow. Uh, Riley, would you like to share some of your work with us? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I feel like this was uh, this is an interesting panel setup because it's like we went really mac uh, macro and now we're going to go really micro into like one aspect of polarization that I was really interested in when this um, project was uh, you know presented to me, which is um, if uh, we're looking at like one polar, uh, say the alt right. Um, I was interested in where indigenous people fit into that alt right project. Um, and I was specifically interested because like around the time that I was writing this, I had just, you know, the, the so-called freedom convoy had really been blowing up my timeline <laughs> and I was seeing it and I was seeing things like, you know, uh, Confederate flags and swastikas and then every child matters flags. Um, and I was like, you know, how is that happening? Um, and I was really perplexed about, um, what I saw as this, like, inclusion or this um, this focus on indigenous issues within this like sector of what I considered to be, and I think a lot of people considered to be like an alt-right, a manifestation of like alt-right politics. Um, and so that was kind of what was the springing board. Um, the ultimate argument that I made was that I think that, um, first of all, I was interested in seeing like why non-indigenous members of the alt-right would be interested and okay with standing beside indigenous people and bolstering their causes just as much as the like non-vaccine passports, considering the fact 
that um, all, all over the place in the alt-right, like, you know, diagnostic literature, they say, like, usually there's, like, tendencies of racism, of, like, nationalism that go against, like, indigenous um, uh, self-determination stances. And um, what I found was, and what I ultimately theorized, is that uh, there's a lot of instrumental salience for these members of the alt-right to co-opt Indigenous struggle as a way to bolster the legitimacy of their own political goals. Um, and so like one example outside of the Freedom Convoy, which I talk about in the paper, um, is uh, Danielle Smith, who at the time said in Alberta that Indigenous people were treated the exact same way um, under the Indian Act as Albertans were being treated by the federal government. Um, <laughs> she was later made, you know, to apologize for that and all of these things, but it was a way of saying, uh, I thought it was really, um, in a way, smart of her, right, to tap into the climate in Canada and say, I know that Canadians at large understand that Indigenous people are oppressed people. If I can align myself with those people and make our struggles seem parallel in any way, that bolsters my claim. Um, and so that is ultimately what I was honing in on. I think that there should be a separate study on why Indigenous people, um, you know, uh, go and maybe are legitimate members of like alt-right parties or alt-right, have alt-right ideals, but that was kind of outside of the scope of what I was trying to do here. Um, and what I, in looking at the street strategic co-option, as I often called it, I, I came to like two sub points, which is one, that of course that that's offensive, that no, Albertans are not treated in the same way under, uh, the, by the federal government in the way that Indigenous people are under the Indian Act, that that is a complete, um, you know, underwriting of what uh, structural oppression and cultural oppression Indigenous people actually face. Um, on the other end of things, that it's also dangerous. Um, because whether or not people actually believe that, uh, it does cause this phenomenon where then Indigenous leaders have to come out and say, hey, no, no, you know, right? And that's exactly what happened. Um, in the case of uh, Premier Smith, um, leaders in Alberta, Indigenous leaders had to come out and say, this is extremely offensive. And if you went into the comment sections on Facebook, you would see people being like, I thought you were for freedom. This is freedom, blah, 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 you know, like, and uh, kind of supporting Danielle Smith's point. On the other end of things in the Freedom Convoy, um, you had the Algonquin Nation, for example, saying, we think it's really offensive that you're doing a pipe ceremony um, during this protest. Um, and it also drew a lot of um, folks online who were um, saying basically that them uh, discounting the, the Freedom Convoy's protests were being... Uh, racist, bad, there was a bunch of different words used. And so whether or not, again, it changes the public perception, it causes a lot of additional problems for Indigenous people to have to contend with, was kind of my ultimate point there. Um, and I have since kind of built on this to see also where these tactics of co-option like exist on the left. And so I think it's something we'll talk about later. But an ultimate point about this being is that the usual tactics that are presented for how to combat the rise of the alt-right don't really work in this particular stance, right? So um, saying like, we need to collect more and better data. Sure, I, I agree with that, but I don't think it necessarily gets to the heart of this problem. Saying we have to do anti-radicalization as like a broad brushstroke doesn't actually get at the heart of this problem. The heart of this problem is that um, settler colonialism has made it such that indigenous issues are first of all misunderstood by the public at large, such that they can be co-opted. And also that when people say that, that there isn't just like a huge outright, um, like a, I guess I'm not trying to say dismissal, but like uh, people didn't tell Danielle Smith and I think the ways that they necessarily should have that she was so wrong, right? Um, and so basically uh, what I'm suggesting is that if we really want to stop indigenous people from being harmed by a rise of the alt-right, uh, that we have to look at anti-radicalization policies and tactics that specifically hone in on um, settler colonial ideology in ways that we don't often think about. Um, and that's something that I think the literature generally hasn't touched. So that was my ideal contribution. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk more about it as we go on. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Riley, and really looking forward to, to your upcoming work um, <laughs> as it continues to come out. And so now I'm really, uh, really excited to turn to Dr. Sonia Solomon, who's the research director at the McGill Center for Media, Tech, and Democracy. Uh, welcome, Sonia, and, and please share your work with us. 
Um, oh, there we go. We can hear you now. Hi, thanks so much, Victoria. So um, just a slight amendment. Um, I'm, I'm now the deputy director of the, of the center uh, and I'm just really grateful to be sharing the room today with so many thoughtful voices in this, in this debate and with our fellow panelists who contributed such um, you know, insightful papers to our essay series. Um, I think I'll just begin by outlining a few broad strokes of what our research center at McGill has found when it comes to polarization online. Um, and I guess sort of, you know, digital democracy more broadly, and then I'll um, sort of hone in on the example of, of climate um, to see how some of these challenges are playing out today and what sorts of, uh, you know, policy opportunities and challenges uh, they might present. So uh, as Victoria uh, also outlined um, in her earlier introduction, our center has sort of been actively grappling with some of these, understanding some of these um, and addressing some of these problems through various research activities. Uh, we've done a national commission with our friends at the PPF uh, and about five citizens assemblies. So it's it's been a long um, process. And throughout this work, we've really observed, you know, a few key things. Um, the particularities of polarization specifically, and I would say sort of online harms uh, more broadly are very real. Um, they are lived. And um, as, as we've just heard, they are felt differently and disproportionately across communities. So they have significant consequence on our democratic society, obviously. Um, I really want to underscore how essential engaging with communities is, um, given that often the very solutions that are presented to deal with polarization online by both uh, governments and by platform companies themselves um, that are designed to protect historically marginalized groups end up further hurting, hurting them. We can get into some of those examples later. Um, and I think there's also kind of a common sentiment um, in Canada to compare ourselves to the states and think, OK, well, it's not um, it's not that bad as as our neighbors down south. Um, but, you know, I'll echo some of some of the earlier findings uh, that we heard from Eric is which is that, you know, affective polarization is on the rise um, and the Canadians are becoming more polarized, but it's it's a different flavor. Um, so the stakes are obviously very high. Um, so we saw some of these stakes kind of rendered pretty explicit during the pandemic, which is when we um, started this work. And we found that social media consumption led to higher exposure to COVID misinformation. And then those that were misinformed um, were much less likely to follow uh, public health recommendations. We also saw a rise of anti-Asian racism and violence in Canada, both during and after the pandemic. Um, and so sort of in summary, <laughs> if I can summarize this, this pretty like, um, integrated issue is that problems like online polarization are um, structural in nature, by which I mean that they are sort of inseparable from the very design and the incentives of online platforms um, and systems themselves. So rather than just the result of uh, bad actors, you know, spreading bad content. And I think this kind of leads me into the example of climate disinformation, um, because the way that networks and bad actors abuse these design inequalities is really clear when we look at um, climate change disinformation online, which has been steadily growing over um, the last few years. Uh, you know, there's multiple studies. One recent study by Influence Map finds that there are about a million and a half daily views of climate misinformation on Facebook. Um, Another finds that greenwashing from just sort of a handful of oil and gas companies um, reached about half a billion users online. And of course, these numbers also tend to spike during major climate movements um, and events like the annual COP meetings um, and things like elections uh, and other important moments in our in our democratic life. So and when I I think a, a brief caveat here, climate, the term climate disinformation, I think is just sort of a recent term for a very long um, and established history of climate obstruction more broadly, um, which is sort of the denial of climate change and other actions that are often led by very well-coordinated and well-financed uh, networks with sort of vested interests in uh, preventing action on climate change. So climate disinformation works so well today um, because we've sort of moved from this overt form of denying 
the existence of um, the climate crisis to um, climate delay, right? So sowing distrust and uncertainty in um, certain mitigation strategies and seeking to delay action uh, on, um, on. And then, you know, some of these political goals aren't really new or unique to social media necessarily, although they're being, uh, they're finding sort of new ground uh, on online networks today. So the debate about, you know, anthropogenic climate change has always been very political, right? Which is to say, um, shaped by vested actors, um, political and economic interests, and as well as ideological and regulatory agendas. Um, public distrust in global warming, which has been predicted for at least a century, has been around for just as long. Um, but what is new and unique today is that we are being kind of siloed into these ideological uh, chambers online and that platform companies are designing their services to drive engagement, not to necessarily protect the public good. Um, and on top of that, they're sort of routinely profiting from known and repeated disinformation campaigns, um, especially when it comes to climate. So again, like I'll just point to the stakes being pretty critical here um, when it comes to climate. Um, you know, the IPCC just recently drew attention to the impacts of climate disinformation for the first time, uh, kind of confirming it as a, as what um, a lot of advocates and, and researchers have been um, working on for, for many years, which is that it's a key barrier to both collective and policy action that's needed to address the climate crisis. And uh, I mean, we probably just need to sort of turn on the news or look out our windows to kind of observe the stakes of inaction uh, when it comes to climate, right? So I won't take too much more time, but I think I'll just end by uh, saying there may be a unique policy opportunity in Canada to deal with some of these design features that drive many of these problems. Uh, and maybe we can dig into those a little later, depending on our conversation today. Thank you, Sonia. I'm sure everybody in the room has so many burning questions, so we're going to get uh, right into the panel. Uh, Eric, I'm going to start with you. Um, thank you for overviewing your research. And you know what I'm really thinking about is this is a historical election year, um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, within Canada, do you think perceptions are overblown when we have when we're worried about polarization? Um, how much of this perceived polarization is accurate? And you know, what are you concerned about, and what do we need to be concerned about? Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question um, because it is it, it's hard to have these conversations because on the one hand, it is clear that Canada is polarizing somewhat, um, especially affectively. But on the other hand, everybody tends to think things are way worse than they actually are. Um, and those perceptions might actually cause even more affective polarization. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard to have these conversations because we don't want to make the problem worse just by talking about it. Um, and, and it is, you know, pol perceived polarization is, is outstrips actual polarization two to three times. Um, so that, and, and a lot of that is probably driven by news, maybe by social media too, but uh, there's more work to be done. Um, so it's something to be concerned about, but we also need to not, we need to lower the temperature as well when we talk about these things. Thanks for that. Uh, one piece I want to dig into your presentation was really about the hypocrisy around behavior within political parties, which I thought was really interesting. I know Ezra Klein talks about uh, polarization in terms of, you know, the electorate becoming more polarized, which makes, you know, politicians more polarized, which creates a vicious cycle. Um, how much do you think of this, you know, this kind of culture within politics is as a result of us wanting to watch a gladiatorial ring? And how much of it is actually from kind of, you know, in-party strategy and dynamics and yeah. wanting to get those one-liners across? Yeah, um, I actually think the, the causal path starts with parties and politicians, um, not with voters. Um, and I think that sequence also plays out in the United States, that you had a, a realignment of the Republican and Democratic parties that, that produced polarization in the electorate. Um, and with the consequences we see today. Um, and as I showed you, Canada's parties are also polarizing. That's, that's just on policy. Um, but I think there are good reasons to suspect rhetorically um, there's a lot more hostility and animosity now than in the past. And, and I think you know, we, there are institutional reasons why that, and you know, inter interacting with the media environment and all that, that, it, that might ex help explain that. Um, one, one thing I, I point to is the, the changing incentives that Canadian parties have faced um, with changes to campaign finance rules uh, that now we're kind of in a, in a forever permanent campaign 
They're fundraising all the time. Uh, the best way to do that is to, to throw inflammatory barbs about each, about each other um, and, and so on and so on. Um, ideolo small donors tend to be more ideological um, than, the, than the general electorate. Uh, and so they play to that crowd um, in, their, in their messaging. And so I think we need to, to think about the incentives that politicians face. It's not to say that social media and all this isn't, isn't part of it, but we kind of let politicians off the hook with a lot of this. Um, and uh, I think we should ask some questions of them. That's really helpful. One thing I'll actually share from the community roundtables, we actually partnered with five community organizations and um, brought a workshop that really asked open-ended questions about all of this to young people. And they actually, told us that it's not working on them, that actually one of the reasons they don't come out to vote is because they actually have an expectation that politicians across party lines will cooperate to an extent to actually get work done. And so they see this all as a huge distraction from actually moving the needle forward on important <coughs> issues. And so I think it's really important to enter that into the, into the conversation that they think it's working, but I think to quite a few people, it's actually turning them off of politics entirely. Um, Riley. Um, thank you for your presentation as well. I think, you know, one thing to actually just get into, why do you think people are so drawn to non-traditional and more disruptive forms of political action right now? Hmm. Um, okay, maybe I'll like zoom in on Indigenous action first, which is that like, I think for Indigenous folks, like we, the thing to stress first of all is that like we have done non-disruptive and non-violent forms of political action for like 40 years now, <laughs> like when I think about like, you know, the white paper from the 60s, um, 70s, and the way that like, we went to negotiations there, folks might even remember as early as 2012, like idle no more. Um, and how like, we were, yeah, maybe it was disruptive to traffic, but like, we were ultimately just like ground dancing in Dundas Square and stuff like that. Um, since then, we've had more indigenous people elected to parliaments than ever before. And still, as especially yesterday, the uh, Auditor General's report shows, um, there is like virtually no changes in Indigenous communities, despite all the increased money, despite this representation. Um, and so we've tried like these nonviolent, non-disruptive ways. And so I think it only makes sense that more and more people are saying, okay, the status quo doesn't work for us and finding ways to turn to alternative forms of political action and whether that means indigenous people are aligning themselves with the alt right which is like maybe one hypothesis i'm like noodling with in my brain is why they showed up at parliament hill in ottawa at that or whether they say you know we're going to go to like maybe more of a you know oka style um like militarized um very independent type of of protest i think that that is inevitable given the conditions um that that they have been dealt over the last several decades at least. Right, people are recognizing that when systems aren't built for them, they won't work for them. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so as you presented, there's a serious issue of far-right co-option of struggle and a manipulation, as you said, of indigenous experiences with colonialism. Can you tell us why this is an attractive tool to the far-right? I think like the big thing there um, is that like it's attractive to the far-right in Canada because like you don't see the same type of co-option in the US in the way that you see it here in Canada. And that has to do, I think, explicitly because of the political climate and the social climate in Canada. And like, so again, you also don't see just any um, maybe marginalized community be being utilized or taken up and instrumentalized in the same way. Like gay rights weren't present in the freedom convoy in the same way that indigenous rights were because the type of fight that indigenous people are fighting against federal power is similar if you're really squinting and blurring the things, you know? Um, and, and like, they're not, you know, like the far right knows that. And so that's what makes it um, analytically salient. And is also, I think, important to emphasize because a lot of the time we do, um, and I think this contributes to polarization, is writing off the other side of, or the polar opposite as being maybe ill-informed or dumb or any of those things. But I'm like, that is highly strategic and it's, it's very smart um, and it works. I don't like it, but it's definitely a, a compelling strategy. Um, and so I think that is, is, is one. They're organized in a way that I think the left often also fails to be, um, which is a whole other type of conversation. <laughs> I look forward to having that conversation one day for sure. Um, and so my final question for you before we turn over to Sonia is, you know, I also want to provide some good path forwards or 
quite frankly, ask you to provide some good uh, paths forward as well. So what can seeking authentic partnerships and, and doing things right actually look like in, uh, in political advocacy, as opposed to the motivating factor being just becoming the new supreme colonial power? Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and so I think um, I'm, I'm really, I was happy to be able to dive into this in both the right and the left in this like new work that I briefly mentioned, because like, I think your, to your question, it's like not um, an exclusive tactic to the right. I think that the left does it all the time. And I see it especially in like climate activism, where um, you'll see people who talk about like the need for um, uh, like a green economy and like all of these things that like ostensibly I agree with, but they completely leave indigenous rights out of their organizing framework and of their objectives. And in my mind, like a robust um, climate policy in this country can't be achieved without indigenous people at the fore. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I uh, think that for me, um, I guess as like from an organizer perspective, if you look around and you don't see indigenous voices include in your strategizing, include in your organize, included in your organizing, um, that should be a red flag to you that like you may be, if you're not already at least vulnerable to perpetuating um, colonial harm against a community, even if like you are righteous in what your mission is. Um, and so that is, is I guess, this, this, how to get people to self-reflect is maybe a more complicated <laughs> question, but I would say blanketly like self-reflection on the part of um, any party who's, who's protesting and organizing. Thank you for that. And who knows, maybe there's a paper to write with Sonia. Mm. <laughs> okay, so Sonia, I'm gonna bring you into the conversation now. Um, so I really wanna zero in on, on, your, on your ecological work. So you're in Heidi's work sheds light on an important example of information interference and climate obstruction through MP Cheryl Gallant's climate lockdown conspiracy as a way to prey on people's emotional response to our long lockdowns. Um, I believe she urged voters to quote, make the coming election a referendum on more lockdowns. So I'm just wondering, how can we hold sitting politicians more accountable for stoking this kind of sentiment by using, uh, as they used its information as an election tool? Yeah, so, um, by the way, um, I, I could talk at length about the need for, for critical self-reflection, so really anytime. Um, <laughs> but um, the climate lockdown um, was a really interesting, so it's an established conspiracy theory, as you note, um, but it had this huge, by way of further context, it had this really huge um, surge online in Canada in the lead up to the 2021 federal election. And then as often happens, um, it got amplified by mainstream media outlets that were trying to actually expose like the dangers of this kind of conspiracy. Um, so, but what's really interesting about this example is kind of the degree to which it resonates with certain myths about inequality that were already circulating um, in our society, right? So climate lockdown was so you know successful um, as a conspiracy theory of the early pandemic because it so seamlessly integrated within this kind of um, existing culture wars framework, right? Which weaponizes messages to kind of fuel uh, distrust in institutions um, and to drive polarizations, polarization, but really to ultimately also reinvigorate historical discrimination. Um, so in that sense, in terms of accountability, it's difficult for me to think of um, this as a bad actor's problem. Um, you know, um, ultimately politicians may use all sorts of tactics to get their messages across. Um, we do have laws in, in place for political ads. Um, there are also, we treat elections as a special kind of, you know, category of time. Um, and in all other media forms, there are guardrails um, in place, but none of these things really kind of hold up meaningfully or are enforced um, consistently with existing platform policies to deal with disinformation and, and political speech more broadly. So I think for me, I'll just come back to kind of, um, it would be really critical to just look at the actual systems that enable this kind of um, discrimination rather than sort of individual instances of harm. Thank you for that. And I think it's the systems uh, which is what I want to really ask you about next. So um, I know you collaborated with Wendy Chen on, um, her, on the essay that really talked about polarization uh, being a technological goal. And I thought that was such a, you know, 
galvanizing sentence. And so if, if people, whether they be politicians, bad actors, uh, those who are more ideologically uh, polarized uh, are all working kind of hand in hand, maybe not together intentionally, but are all kind of out there systemically uh, polarizing, then what can we do about it? What are some pathways forward? And I recognize that's a really, really difficult question, but just wondering, you know, what you've been meditating on as a result of the work. Yeah. Um, as you said, it's a challenging question. I mean, just to, I, I would point everyone in the room um, to, to read the interview with, with Wendy Chen, because her work on this is absolutely seminal. Um, she's really kind of traced this long history of how segregation and like eugenics is actually built into network science and network design. Um, and so for her, polarization is not a flaw, but a feature of the way that online networks and, and platforms are built. And this came up uh, in my work um, with Heidi on our paper as well, um, which is that, you know, election interference it's it's a feature of democratic societies right it's not it's not a flaw um and so i think in terms of pathways um you know wendy chan does some fantastic work um at her center as well on building sort of different kinds of networks and and connections um in terms of what we do at our center at mcgill uh, we obviously focus a lot on policy and i think there is an opportunity in canada uh with the online harms act being tabled that would seek to hold platforms accountable um, for the design choices that they make, um, which may put people and communities at risk and at harm. So it would oblige large online platforms um, like Instagram and Facebook, you know, to have standards in place that factor in the potential for harm for certain design features uh, that might amplify and circulate content online. And of course, with that, you know, um, no online environment will ever be 100%, you know, free of risk. Um, but platforms, I think, like any other private companies that have consumer facing products, do have an obligation to show that they are at least prepared to mitigate any potential harms. And I think that's really key here is um, because a lot of these problems are known, um, and they continue and not only do they continue online, but um, platforms get very rich off these kinds of problems. So I think it's about showing the mitigation strategies um, before that harm happens rather than kind of dealing with it after. Thank you for that. I think it's really interesting that we really need to challenge these innovators, so to speak, to find a different way other than just monetizing anger and polarization. Um, I think that would be truly innovative. Um, and the other thing I would just add to that is that, you know, we know these are not neutral spaces. We know that there's algorithms that are prompting and urging and manipulating behavior. And one other thing that we actually heard from the youth across the political spectrum was really how fearful they are around the social pressures and quite frankly of cancel culture online. People are afraid to speak. People are afraid not to speak and are being called out on online spaces, even at times when they may, may need an opportunity to grieve, to self-reflect, to stay quiet. And so if we can't give each other that grace in the public, on technological spaces, throughout technological spaces, then you know we have a serious problem. So one of the big questions that I'm left with after this really systemic diagnostic is you know, what's a way back from making mistakes? Because if young people can't do that online and in civic spaces, uh, while showing like accountability, uh, you know, apologizing, uh, really doing all those things, how can they? How can people come back from being canceled? So that's a, a big question and feature of the report that I have as well. Um, I want to ask all of you very quickly, um, <laughs> where is your work going next, Riley? Oh, um, so uh, that paper should be coming out with you, or the chapter rather, with uh, you of Manitoba Press. So um, if you're interested in that, you can look at it there. Um, but I'm also, I, I think uh, as much as I found it like infuriatingly interesting to look at like the art alt-right and indigenous people's place in there. Um, I'm trying to shift focus now to look at um, more pragmatic and better organizing strategies on the part of the right. And, and in, and as much as like this might not uh, be like the, the best thing to say, but like taking some inspiration truly from the way that the right organizes that I think is far superior to the way that we do on the left. Well said. Um, and so I, I, I see a lot of those um, gaps now looking um, at maybe the other polar 
Uh, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about that these days. Eric, can I ask you the same question? Um, we're going to be fielding some surveys in, in a few different countries measuring support for political violence and, and norm violations. So we're going to see how countries compare, or how it all relates to affective polarization. Um, and uh, I've got a project on perceptual polarization too, about uh, um, which direction the causal arrow goes, if those misperceptions cause further polarization or, or the reverse. So I'm um, going to be wrapping up those projects in the next year. I appreciate that because while this project really focused on Canada, obviously online it knows no boundaries and, and no kind of nation uh, separation. So I think that work will be really great to read when it comes out. Uh, Sonia, can you also share with us where your work is going next? Sure. Um, so I'm, I make the same joke everywhere I go, which is that like every job is now um, a climate job and, and every, you know, mm -hmm. paper should, should now be about climate in some ways. And so I'm trying to think through the intersection of um, tech policy and climate policy. And, and I actually think tech policy is climate policy uh, and, uh, um, so I've got uh, a few different things. There's a chapter coming out in a volume with uh, U of Tor Toronto Press uh, on this new crop of emerging carbon accountability platforms. Um, and then I've got some sort of uh, broad strokes work on uh, how climate can fit into the platform an existing platform governance agenda that tries to deal with sort of content problems, data problems, um, and infrastructure. Thank you for that. And then I'm going to throw the panel a curveball and anyone who wants to answer it can. I did not give them this question in advance. So, um, and then that gives you all a chance to think of what your questions might be. Um, but also interested to hear your thoughts on this answer too. So as we know, 2024 will be the biggest election year in history with over 2 billion eligible to cast a vote should they choose to. So how will misinformation via AI affect democratic processes and free and fair elections? Uh, what we know is that democracy depends on a shared sense of truth. So how can we protect democracy in the face of one of its biggest challenges to date? What narratives might bad actors around AI want to craft and to what end? So um, who would like to Me. try it out? Okay. <laughs> See, they're, they're all they're all keeners, so I knew someone would jump at it. Uh, Sonia, please go right ahead. Um. Maybe I'll jump in here just because it, it does kind of echo um, some of the examples of climate disinformation. But, you know, it's interesting, the characterization of democracy, I like to me, um, democracy may not be actually a shared vision of truth. Um, in fact, that might actually very well be a um, possibly the opposite of democracy. <laughs> but it's 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 really about deliberation. And it's about debate, and it, it essentially about conflict. Um, I don't know if we want a universal sort of information ecosystem, but we do want to preserve the and I and Victoria, I, I know that's not what you meant. Um, I think we do want to preserve the ability to debate information. Um, and for that, I think we need trust, right? Because without trust, information is just kind of, you know, words online. Um, and when we look historically to examples of how and why propaganda campaigns succeed, you know, in, in um, counter climate movements or, or other areas, it's really less about presenting entirely false information. And it's more about sort of ordering information in a certain way and attaching it to existing um, truths, if if we can call it that. Um, so I think, I, I don't know if we need to necessarily worry about truth versus fact, um, because that relationship, I think, has already changed so much. I think it's really about our relationships to the to trust and to authenticity um, and to what feels authentic that, that we really need to worry about because sort of the more polluted I think our information ecosystem becomes with you know AI driven like synthetic text or, or other things the harder it will be to not only find accurate information I think but then to actually trust it when we do um, but I'm curious to hear what what everyone else thinks and and there are lots of people in, in the room I'm sure that um, work on these kinds of issues too that I'd love to hear from. Any comments or shall I go to the audience? Uh, more time for the audience. Okay. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So I think that's a perfect segue to our Q&A. So um, just wondering what questions people have after this incredible discussion. Thank you so much to our speakers. I have a question. 
Yes, of course you can. <laughs> um, you said we're all keeners. This is yeah. something. Yes. Um, I, so also, I should note that um, uh, Eric was my professor for uh, a, a course in my PhD. So like, I now I have a question for you again, <laughs> again, um, which is that like. I, I can take from the point that like, um, you know, polarization isn't as bad as people think it's bad, but do like for what small polarized extremes there are th that exist, do they have an outsized impact still yes. nonetheless on like actual politics and policy making? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. And just more about that idea, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, to me, there's, there's two separate issues. One is to what degree are we becoming more polarized and two is, how much influence and how visible are the people that are polarized? And, and I think that is more important than the first thing. And I think there's, there's more of it. So social media in particular provides a vehicle to mobilize extreme voices that may have always existed in society that just weren't given a microphone before. Um, and, and because they're given a voice, then the media focus on that voice and then it, it kind of reverberates through the media ecosystem that way. And so, ev so even if you know we're not becoming more extreme on average, extremists have more voice. They're they're more powerful than they have been in the past in that sense. And to me, that's that's the most important thing. Um, so you're right. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm wondering about Riley's and the alt right thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So our online audience can hear well. Thank okay, you so sorry much. About that. Um, just do you think that there was a technique there that they were they were trying like Daniel Smith was trying to come across as reasonable mm -hmm. the the indigenous population who were all then called to be defensive and respond mm -hmm. so then that puts them in this like no saying place right like she comes across as so reasonable saying something that is absolutely not true it's a lie but she comes across as a reasonable person and then everybody who's indigenous is in this position of having to defend themselves and then coming across as unreasonable, you know, I mean, not that they're unreasonable, they're completely reasonable, but coming across as unreasonable. And I'm just wondering about if you could speak to maybe that dynamic that is being leveraged. Mm. Okay. If you think yeah, there is yeah. a dynamic Good that's question. being leveraged. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um... I don't know, for, for some reason, my mind like initially went to this, uh, the point we already talked about, like of like uh, a, a cancel culture where I feel like um, uh, indigenous people are, are called to speak to this and address this. And then um, the, I guess like then Danielle Smith, her whole thing that she gets to say in return or whoever, in this case, it's Danielle Smith, is that like, um, I, I'm being persecuted. I was being reasonable. I was doing all of those things, which is like the fact that like cancel culture, as I think we've been sold it, is like the point I'm getting at, is, is not actually cancel culture. It's this space for actual discussion, apology, dialogue, debate, like all of those things. But it's often the most powerful people, systemically powerful people like Daniel Smith, like J.K. Rowling, like Margaret Atwood, you know, insert name here, who get to then use this as like um, an impeachment, I guess, of their free speech. Um, and so I think that uh, maybe finding a different language or a different way to point that out, as opposed to getting um, baited in to this like vicious circle. Yes. Um, and, and like, to, but also to give space to the fact that like indigenous people like have a right and deserve to be and whoever is on the receiving end of the less powerful actor in this case deserves to be defensive and should have space to have it be defensive, but then don't automatically, I guess, get discounted in this like, um, in this really, what I think is a, is a toxic dynamic of, yeah. um, uh, skirting accountability through things like cancel culture in this moment, particularly largely. that maybe kind of like it continues what you were just saying so you had mentioned that young people especially and i'm also guessing in indigenous communities as well and maybe even and also in the larger sphere people might feel afraid to speak or required to speak or and then also have uh, like a dissonance within themselves which is that human element of like i didn't get to think about what i said or, or even you know like taking accountability doesn't look the way i wanted it to and that sort of thing is is there any are there any models that you've seen whether it's young people indigenous communities elsewhere 
where people are able to actually work through things productively, whether it's in uh, an, an immediate public forum like the internet or you know private forums like you know, groups of some kind or something in between where there's some filter that allows people to come to consensus. Mm -hmm. Like what's practically happening out there right now? I can start with one invitation actually. Um, I actually haven't seen much, to be totally honest, and yet this became such a big feature of, you know, the report that Justin Ling actually synth synthesized all the work. Um, and this was a really important piece that I think stunned a lot of people. Um, so I'm actually going to run a workshop at the Democracy Exchange uh, conference uh, in April that the DACE is putting on about the nature of cancel culture, have a bit of a collaborative discussion, and then actually put people to work to say, how do we find a way back? You know, how do we really talk about this problem? Is cancel culture really the right term for it? Um, and how can you see people making the kind of amends and demonstrating what they need to be uh, demonstrating to actually receive that grace from others and not experience that kind of hate online or in other spaces? So um, you should come <laughs> and anybody else. But uh, that's my answer. Do either of you have anything to weigh in on or Sonia for that matter? know if anybody has anything I'd like to hear if you do please <laughs> please but I guess I'll say first that like for me um in terms of like instead of calling it cancel culture um I've been more I think it's more generative at least for me to call it like a politics of disposability which is what I think I like the people that. who you know get mad at cancel culture are actually mad at. but they think they're being disposed of arbitrarily as a first response um and I and when you frame it that way we can also hone in on things like the fact that um, disposability is a very like neoliberal colonial um, uh, you know ideal that like this idea that we're all individuals and individuals can be cast aside if you have a communal vision of of life and community it's it's way way harder to justify the disposability of individuals um, and so like there's a whole bunch of I guess like maybe tactics I'm working on like conflict resolution um, policies that are around like a non disposability framework. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess maybe that may, a suggestion for framing, but I don't know. If anybody I love that term. I think, uh, focus on responsibility rather than disposability is really important. And actually a friend in the audience, uh, often talks to me about the fact that, you know, freedom of speech does not mean freedom from responsibility. And so I think we can absolutely hold each other accountable without that kind of disposability that you're talking about. Eric or Sonia, did you want to weigh in at all? No? Okay, great. Uh, I have a maybe a last question, unless there's more in the audience. Um, so my name is Catherine. I work with the Democratic Engagement Exchange with uh, with Victoria, and uh, we're working around thinking through the sort of key issues uh, for Canada's electoral democracy in a major election year here, but also abroad. And um, the whole question of polarization, I think you all tied it to trust as well. And so one of the questions we have is. How do we build and make sure that Canadians have access to um, an information ecosystem that they can trust and who should be held accountable in building that information ecosystem? There's a decline in journalism. There's a lack of resources for a lot of organizations that would be typically um, these, these trusted organizations and, and people aren't necessarily engaging on the platforms where those this information is available. So how do you see sort of a pathway forward um, to build up uh, information ecosystems where Canadians are able to inform themselves and make uh, decisions that are good for them and, and their communities um, as they're casting their votes. It's an excellent and very difficult question. Thank you, Kat. Impossible one, maybe. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any initial thoughts? Um, I, I guess I can say a, a little bit about less about the information ecosystem side because I don't I don't have um, kind of a strong grounding in regulation or, or related areas. Um, but I think we could build more resilience um, at a younger age, um, kind of getting people used to having discussions about conversation, having political conversations with one another, um, encouraging people to perspective take. Um, all of that can can build resilience for when when they do enter an online space. They can and media literacy too, um, so that they can take what they see with a grain of salt and perhaps behave differently on those platforms. Um, so you know, I think I think we could do more of that uh, earlier. Um, but uh, but as far as the design of 
social media platforms and all that, I, I don't, don't have a strong view of it. Sonia, am I right to remember that uh, Jessica Johnson is currently a fellow at the center who's working a little bit on the future of journalism in the CBC, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and I mean, as, as, as we're all sort of um, unfortunately admitting in the, in the room, this is a really complicated issue and it depends on a whole host of things. I think um, one of the first things that this question brings up to me is kind of the centralization of power, right? Like the decline of journalism um, and the decline of public engagement uh, on the one hand and like the centralization of power of, of a few handful of, you know, kind of big tech actors that are shaping the debate and the contours of, of public speech. Um, and I think that that needs to be disrupted um, to use kind of a, a, a bad word, um, a, a techie word for it. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, pathways forward and, and how we deal with this, I think public engagement and Victoria, you can speak to this because you guys have done such fantastic work on this, but public engagement is just going to be so key here. Right. Um, and the, um, especially getting involvement from traditionally underrepresented groups and marginalized communities, right? Because as we've heard today, evidence tells us that they are most adversely impacted by these harms and have been also at the forefront of um, providing that evidence base and actually providing solutions. And so I think it's like, it's also about bringing people in to a conversation about um, the solutions before we sort of talk about the solutions themselves, uh, if, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you, Sonia. And, and to everybody in the room, we did create a workshop that we brought to community serving organizations that was nonpartisan, fact based and really open ended to get people's opinions. And I think that was a way to at least build trust around this project. And so I think if you're interested in having that kind of conversation with your community, I invite you to get in touch. Um, and we have one last question. But right before we go to you, I do want to say that at the exchange, they are hosting the Canadian Boat Summit in early June. Uh, and a lot of these conversations will also happen there. So very much encourage all of you to uh, join Kat and John and the rest of the team at that conference as well. Okay, and so last question, over to you. My last question was that uh, now we are required to state that we are an occupied land. Okay. For me, that is rather a partial acknowledgement. Uh, if I occupy somebody's land, I say, okay, I am I'm occupying your land, then what? <laughs> okay, so it might give you a false impression that we have made compens compensation mm -hmm. for our actions in the past, but to me that's not sufficient. So how does a Algonquin or a Cree or a Yukwa thinks about the statement? It might give us a uh, feeling of, uh, oh, we have done our duty. Like it's a performance. Is yeah. that what you're saying? So, yeah, I, I've heard different I, things. Um, I'll also turn to Riley to to give her thoughts if she'd like. Uh, I've, I've heard uh, from many different communities over the years that in, in some sense, the land acknowledgement increases knowledge and awareness and that can spur action. And then I've also heard from different voices as well that yes, it does feel performative. And so I think it means different things to different people. I think it really depends on what you do and what you say after you provide that land acknowledgement. Uh, the one that I actually share quite a bit calls on people to do this, not just in the moment, but on every day and to really think and reflect on what truth and reconciliation means in the context of their profession, their expertise and their work and to be really active with it. Uh, did you, not to put you on the spot, did yeah. you want to add anything there? <laughs> yeah. mean, land acknowledgements are, are the hot topic these days for somebody mm -hmm. in the Indigenous studies. I, I love that um, we started and they're probably ending with, with land yeah. acknowledgement here. Thank you for that. Um, but I, I mean, I guess one thing that I'll say in like a lot, I, a lot of the justified hate of land acknowledgements, because I do think that they often are performative, that they're often done to like scapegoat real action, all of those things, is also that land acknowledgements are a very Indigenous tradition. Like, if you, if, in, if Anishinaabe people, which are like my people, were meeting, we would meet and begin with like an acknowledgement of space and of process and like of all of those things. And so like, we didn't call it a land acknowledgement, but that was, was a practice and like a perspective that is not this like newfound Canadian woke thing that we're doing, you know? Um, so I guess to your point, it is often about, um, like, is this just um, an action or is this a shift in like an ontological perspective you have about the world, your relationship to the world, your responsibilities to land, all of those things? Because like that practice for us was, was a representative of, 
of like, yeah, again, a different ontological perspective. I don't know that that's the case in, in uh, present Canada, but I think uh, it has the potential to be, and I guess don't rate off land acknowledgements that easy is like my underlining point. <laughs> well, I think that's a great final word. Uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists. I also want to thank all of you for joining this evening and for all that we offered. I feel like we had a really interesting discussion. What I'll leave you with is we still have so much work to do in this area and figuring out that this polarization age that we live in affects us all and how technology compounds these systemic issues. We can see for sure that it enables more people to participate in the public sphere and then discourages them from doing so. It creates transparency while also awarding anonymity and really bad behavior online. It broadens freedoms, but it diminishes common well-being. So we're living in a time of great complexity and we all have so much work to do, but we will go on. I think a lot of us in this room are here tonight because we care about it and we wanna be part of a healthier society. So my invitation to all of you is please keep in touch with our work. If you're interested in participating in more dialogue, absolutely get in touch uh, and or partner with us. And uh, I just wish all of you a wonderful evening. So thank you. And thank you to all of you. <laughs>